Let's talk a little bit about deterministic effects. So now we're gonna talk about that dose, but we're gonna talk about doses that are much lower than that range that lends itself to those uh, acute, acute radiation sickness syndromes. For deterministic effects, we think there's a, there's a threshold, right? So in other words, below a certain level of dose, these don't occur. And then above that level, we start to see them occurring. And the severity of them is proportional to how much, how much above that level of threshold we are. So again, using uh, skin injury as our example, we don't think that skin injury occurs if the radiation level is kept below a certain amount. And then if it goes above that, the severity of the skin damage increases as the radiation exposure goes above that level. And each organ has a specific dose for which that occurs, and the classic examples are cataract formation, skin injury, and, and sterility, and they're the ones I'll mention here. So we think the threshold for cataract formation is 0.5 gray. By the way, before 2011, we listed it as at 2 gray. So again, you ought to realize that this notion of this threshold is kind of a general rule of thumb, right? I mean, before 2011, we thought the threshold was 2 gray, and then we reduced it to 1 fourth that value for the threshold. You wonder how well we know what some of these thresholds really are. And their recommendations for decreasing, um, they were recommended that year for decreasing the annual equivalent dose to 20 millisieverts, averaged over five years, with no single year exceeding 50 millisieverts to help stay below that uh, half a gray range. The, the truth is, wear your eye protection during your fluoro procedures, right? Because um, one, the, the lens of the eye is relatively sensitive to radiation uh, with cataract formation, and so we don't, clearly we don't know what the threshold level is accurately by, by that change. So just the prudent thing to do is to wear your eye protection there. So what about skin injury? So the threshold is about two gray. Now, now this is fairly high, right? This is getting in that range of that hemopoietic syndrome that we're talk, talking about. And, and usually we only see this in kind of restricted areas to the body, a focal dose on examinations that would take a fairly long period of time. So think about cardiac interventional procedures, right, where you might be, they're having difficulty with uh, placing stents or something that go on an extended period of time. Um, perhaps uh, a, a tips that becomes overly complicated and so you know if you change your projection so that your skin entry site that your radiation beam is going through varies a little bit where you can help protect because you're not irradiating the same mass of tissue over and over again so there's a couple things there the range of severity right at, at uh, transient edema, uh, erythema at 2 gray dermal necrosis at 18, secondary ulceration at 20 gray. And there's actually some, some nice studies looking at the fluoro time, and you can see here going down from the early transient uh, erythema, temporary epilation, uh, main erythema, permanent epilation, down as the dose increases. But, but some of this is probably best demonstrated by the, the number of uh, uh, images that are out there in some publications and some case reports and different things where you notice that here's that kind of almost prodromal type phenomenon that we were talking about when we talked about radiation sickness, right? There's a, an injury, a, a burn that occurred early on which really looked like it healed up fairly nicely at 20 weeks, but due to the death of the tissue deep to that, right, the, the deep layer in the dermis at 20 weeks, we see this tremendous ulceration there. In terms of sterility, uh, permanent sterility in about the four gray range, uh, lower in men uh, than women. Uh, the threshold decreases with age, so that goes lower as we get older. And temporary sterility in men uh, as low as a, a half a gray exposure. Um, so, you know, we you certainly, unless we're doing some procedure that involves the gonads or having to be able to see something right in the rear, it's hard, you can't shield the pelvis in a woman if what you're trying to look at are the pelvic structures, right? But, uh, but if in an exam where we're looking in another region, certainly shielding uh, is help, can be helpful. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, the stochastic effects. So with stochastic effects, we don't think there's a threshold, right? So that a single x-ray, just a single photon, 
may unfortunately damage something that results in someone getting a cancer. So the probability of the effect increases with increasing dose, right? So if with a single x-ray, the probability is 0.0000000001, with more x-rays than that, that probability increases. But the severity doesn't increase, right? It's not that, well, you got a higher dose of radiation, therefore you're more likely to get a more aggressive cancer, right? So probability of the disease goes up with dose, but the severity of the disease doesn't necessarily go up with dose. That's different from those deterministic effects that we, we talked about. There's a latency period. There's a period of time between when that radiation occurred and when these uh, uh, things manifest themselves. And we use a linear no-threshold model of risk to do that. And I'm going to show you an example of that. And by the way, that model, frankly, is probably not correct, but it's probably the most prudent model for us to work with in the absence of better, better knowledge than we have. And our, the prototypic example is cancer, although some of the genetic uh, effects we, we could also include in that. All right, so I think I mentioned all of that already. We mentioned uh, the latency. Um, the latency can be decades, and uh, we talked about this linear no-threshold model. So risk is proportional to dose, and there's no minimum safe dose, linear and no-threshold to that. And he here's that model. So here's our linear no-threshold model. Um, so our knowledge about the risk that radiation poses is really based on people being exposed to much higher level doses of radiation, right? We know from, unfortunately, nuclear accidents, atomic bomb blasts, things, how, what, how harmful doses of radiation are up in this range. And if we linearly extrapolate from those, we get that very low level of radiation has some harmful effect here. And that's... Uh, um, what we assume, that there is no threshold, that any bit of radiation might be the case. Here would be a threshold model. This would say that, you know what, if the radiation exposure you get is lower than this amount, it, it, it has no negative effect, has no beneficial effect, has no negative effect. And here's the hormetic model, where we've got this hormesis, where this really says that below a certain level, radiation actually has a beneficial effect. Okay? And the truth is that these low levels, we don't particularly know. I mean, it, it may intuitively make sense that we ought to have some protective mechanism to radiation. After all, we live exposed to radiation on a daily basis, right? The body ought to have repair mechanisms for handling low levels of damage from radiation. But the truth is, we don't know for sure what this level is, if or even if this threshold model is true. And so the safer thing to assume is this linear no threshold model even if we feel like that may be overly conservative. The problem with that is there are a lot of people out here who take the linear no threshold model that we use, which we're purposely using to be really conservative. And they say, oh, well, at this low level of radiation, here's the number of harmful cancers you create. And then they multiply it by the entire population receiving that dose of radiation and say, here are, many, here are how many cancers created by doing CT exams. And does everyone see, again, I want to tell you, right, we make this assumption so that we minimize where our deleterious effects that radiation might have. Okay? It's a very different thing to then use those numbers, apply them to a population as a whole, and say that is the deleterious effect that it does have. Okay? Stochastic effects. So we talked about the prototype of cancers. There are numerous examples of radiation exposure resulting in increased number of cancers later in life. Greater risk with earlier age of exposure and greater risk depending upon the types of tissue irradiated. And I show a chart here, and, and you'll notice that nothing in this chart has to do with patients received a C one CT scan when they were uh, a kid or whatever. These are people who had a radiation dose of greater than 50 gray uh, associated with central nervous system uh, tumors or got radiation treatment for a leukemia. And then 
the types of cancers that they ended up developing later on, so central nervous system, thyroid, and breast cancers, or whatever. So again, right, a lot of these cancers that we see developing later in life have to do with much higher doses of radiation than most of our diagnostic imaging studies. So what are the sources of, of radiation? Just to, to briefly go over, over those, right? Because I already have mentioned to you that um, you know, we, we see quite a bit of radiation exposure just from natural background. So the average person receives about 620 millirams uh, per year. 50% of that is background and 50% of that is man-made. And, and the man-made radiation is almost exclusively from medical sources. And in medical sources, CT is the major contributor to that. As a matter of fact, 50% of the man-made exposure per, uh, approximately is from CT. So of the exposure the population sees, right, 25% of the total radiation exposure the population sees is from CT. Half of it natural occurring, half of it medical, and half of that medical half is CT, 25% from CT. So where, is that, where are the natural sources? Well, some of it's from the soil, right? Some of it's for, from radon and thoron. Radon, unfortunately, when it decays, gives off an alpha particle, right? We, we don't worry a whole lot about alpha particles because they are so massive, right? They have two protons and two neutrons, and they have plus two charge that, frankly, if someone were shooting a beam of alpha particles at you, if you held up a piece of paper, it would stop those alpha particles. But unfortunately, those get liberated into the air. And when we inhale that air, right, they can then end up landing on the surface, the lining of the lungs and those kind of things. So that's how our dose tends, tends to occur, occur from those. And unfortunately, in people in certain parts of the country, right, in their basements, uh, there's some radon gas that's liberated through there, and, uh, and people end up getting exposed as that decays and gives off those alpha particles. Uh, there's some extraterrestrial component, right? 5% of it comes from extraterrestrial. 5% uh, or so comes from the food chain, uh, potassium. So anybody who eats bananas, uh, you're exposing yourself to some potassium-40 there. So what about the man-made? About 50%, as I mentioned, about half of, half of that's coming from CT. Nuclear medicine's the next big player, interventional, and then radiography, fluoro, a smaller uh, proportion. And then there's a small amount of other, industrial, occupational, consumer goods kind of thing. And here's a nice chart uh, that kind of breaks down some of, the, some of the sources. So look, the background from radon and thoron, right, is really the only thing that's bigger than CT here. But I want to make one point about this portion of this, and that is, yes, there is some variation in that. You know, if you decide to live in Colorado instead of living uh, at sea level, your exposure to naturally occurring radiation is higher um, than it is. But, but this portion, the 50% that's medical, is, is, has a very different distribution. And, in the days of HIPAA, I can't, ask, I can't ask this question anymore, but I used to always ask something like, you know, how many people in the room had a CT scan this past year? Okay, because when you look at the radiation dose uh, seen um, by the population, it's around on the order of every person in the country getting one CT a year. That's, that's what the medical dis, uh, of dose is. A and yet, in the room, there would be maybe two or three people who would raise their hand and had a CT scan. And as radiologists, we've all been in the rating room where we've pulled up the patient who's gotten their, you know, sixth renal stone protocol CT of, of the year kind of thing, right? So there's a very unequal distribution of the medical sources of radiation. I think I mentioned all of these things before, just checking through there to make sure you've got, the, got those. Yes, and I, I just, I mentioned this too, right? This um, 6.2 millisieverts, that's approximately the amount, this is the amount that we get from medical uh, on, on average. That's the approximately the amount of an abdomen pelvis CT. So like I said, if you, if you took all the medical and you uniformly distributed it across the entire population, it would kind of be the equivalent